Okay, so this is a one slider to cover one topic. And the topic is ATP production. All right, so you'll notice that there's three methods. All right, so we're going to go through the first method known as creatine phosphate, a second method called anaerobic glycolysis, and then the third method is aerobic respiration. Three different ways to generate energy. Uh, the first method, creatine phosphate, notice it's for short durations. So basically like bursts of energy. So if you need a burst of energy because maybe you're sprinting, right, and you need that burst, or maybe you're lifting weights and you need that short burst of energy, we're going to use this method quite a bit. The second method is a little longer, so notice it could last up to a couple minutes. All right, so a little bit longer than the 15 seconds, but then you start to run out of the ability to do this. So then you need this third method, aerobic respiration, for long-term energy, minutes up to hours. So if you're exercising for you know, 15, 20 minutes to an hour, you're going to be using primarily this third method. All right. Okay, so let's look at creatine phosphate. First of all, we got to remind ourselves of ATP. All right, ATP is the energy currency of cells. In order to extract that energy, the one of the phosphates is removed. All right, so ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So there's three phosphates. The energy is in between phosphates. So to harness that energy, you remove a phosphate. All right. So notice you're getting the energy for contraction. But what are you left with? You're left with that phosphate that was removed. And now you have a molecule called ADP. It's adenosine diphosphate. So what creatine phosphate does is it basically donates its phosphate, all right? So muscles have creatine phosphate, all right, but a limited amount. But what it can do is just quickly hand off its phosphate to basically regenerate ATP very quickly. As a result, though, you're left with just creatine, and then that's a waste product. So... You have a limited amount of creatine phosphate, so you're going to have a limited capacity to regenerate that ATP quickly. All right? So again, creatine phosphate donates its phosphate to ADP to reform ATP for short energy bursts. All right? Once you start running low on that, you got to start you know, kicking in another method. So this method is anaerobic. That means no oxygen. So it does not require oxygen. Glycolysis means you lyse or break glucose. All right, so you need glucose. Now, where do you get glucose from? You get it from the glycogen, right? That's that stored polysaccharide. And you get it from blood, blood sugar. So now the muscle has glucose. All right, it breaks down that glucose. It basically breaks glucose in half. So when you break glucose in half, you get the two halves, which are called pyruvic acid. That process results in the generation of two ATPs. Now, there's a little trick here. It actually requires two ATPs to make four ATPs. But if it takes two, to make four, you're going to net only two. Does that make sense? I'll say it one more time. It requires two, enter two ATPs to generate four. But because it took two to make four, you only actually get a net production of two ATP molecules for every glucose you break. Now, it just so happens you can do this pretty quick. You just keep breaking that glucose, and you can keep making that ATP. Now, as a result, what do you get? Okay, you get some energy, all right, short-term source of energy. You get that pyruvic acid, though. So that pyruvic acid from glucose, you got two options. You can use it over here for more energy, or it becomes lactic acid, all right? 
And if it becomes lactic acid, it goes into your blood. Uh, if you produce too much of this, it could cause acidosis, um, or it can eventually go to your liver. Your liver is really smart. It knows how to take that lactic acid and convert it back to glucose. But anyway, the point is anaerobic glycolysis. What do you need to know? Doesn't require oxygen. It requires glucose. All right. And it nets two ATPs, but also produces two pyruvic acids that can then be further utilized during aerobic respiration. All right? Okay. Now, if you don't have oxygen, you can't do this. All right? And if you don't have enough oxygen, you'll start to form all this lactic acid. So you want to be able to breathe. And when you exercise, you'll notice you're going to be breathing more and more and more because you're going to be producing more and more of the pyruvic acid, so you want to be able to further utilize it. All right? So aerobic means it requires oxygen. So you need oxygen. Where does that come from? Well, it comes from hemoglobin in your blood, and don't forget the myoglobin. So it's got your muscle cells have some oxygen stored up there. What else do you need? You need mitochondria. That's what this structure is. All right? So if you've got pyruvic acid, you've got oxygen, and you've got mitochondria, you can make a lot of ATP for minutes to hours of energy. All right? What do you get as a byproduct? You get a little carbon dioxide, so we got to breathe that out, and you actually make a little bit of water, and you generate heat. All right, so those are basically the byproducts, heat, carbon dioxide, and water. But what you're going for is all that ATP. Now, notice what else you can use. What if you're running low on glucose? All right, maybe you're burning all this glucose, you're using all this pyruvic acid. You can get energy from other things. You can get it from fatty acids that come from adipose, triglycerides. You can get energy from amino acids by breaking down protein. So if you're exercising, right, let's say you're, you want to lose weight, well, you're going to be just burning blood sugar for the first probably 20 minutes, all right? So if you're trying to lose fat, you got to burn up all your glucose first in order to then get to the adipose tissue and the fatty acids. And you really don't want to use protein for energy. You'd rather use the protein to maybe build muscle. Uh, that's kind of when you're running out of the other two. You're running out of the glucose and you're running out of the fatty acids. All right, three methods to generate energy. Next slide talks about what we mean by a motor unit. A motor unit by definition is one neuron and all the muscle cells it, it controls. All right, so some neurons can control just a handful of cells. Other neurons can control hundreds or thousands of cells at a time. So what would be the difference? If you have a small motor unit, so that means you've got one neuron, it's going to just a handful of cells. If you've got a lot of these, you have more control. All right. So again, you're not going to have one small motor unit. You're going to have a lot of these. But what that allows is you to control more precisely because you can control a small number of fibers at a time. So muscles that have very fine, precise movements have a high number of small motor units. So we're talking finger muscles, right? Because your fingers are very precise. Eyes are super precise, right? The muscles that move your eyeballs are very precise. If you've got muscles that are more, don't have to be very precise, but they're, you know, large weight-bearing muscles like your thigh muscles, like your quadriceps and your, your gluteus maximus and stuff, those are going to have large motor units. So they're going to have neurons that control a lot of fibers at the same time. That gives that muscle more, more strength, but not very much precision, right, or fine movements. So... Understand what a motor unit is. Understand why some muscles have small motor units and other muscles have large motor units. Next topic is types of contraction. 
This always can be a little confusing to students, but if we use an example, like picking up something, carrying it, and then setting it down, um, it'll make sense. So you could actually be doing this at some point after we learn this. So types of contractions. So in this picture, we're looking at the biceps muscle. So your biceps muscle is right here. When that biceps contracts and it shortens, it, you're going to allow to you're going to be able to pick something up. So it looks like he's picking up a book. All right. So the muscle is contracting, and when it contracts, it shortens. That's called concentric contraction. All right. Now, if you put that book down, your biceps is actually still in a state of contraction. And you can test this, right? Go grab a book. As you slowly set it down, your biceps muscle is going to be, you know, uh, contracted. It's going to be tough. You can feel it stiff, if you will. But at the same time, it's lengthening. So if the muscle is lengthening, but still having contractions, that's called eccentric contraction. So putting down something, putting down the book or putting down the, a food tray. If you're just holding it steady, right, in order to hold this book like this, that biceps has to be in a contracted state. But it's not lengthening nor shortening. The length is staying the same. So isometric means same length, all right, or same measurement. So an isometric contraction there's muscle tension, but there's no change in the length, no shortening or lengthening of the muscle, all right? And it all has to do with kind of the load, right? If you think about it, the muscle force is greater than the weight of the book, so you're moving it this way. The weight of the book is greater than the force, so it's moving this way. And then the weight of the book is the same as the force of the muscle, so there's no movement. All right, so three types of muscle contractions. All right, last topic, types of muscle fibers. All right, so a single muscle, so let's think about a muscle. All the muscle fibers or cells are not identical. All right, you've got three basic types. Some muscles might have more of one type of fiber and less of the others. Another muscle might have more of one and not the others, and so on. And it all depends on what kind of muscle. So what I like to do, yes, this is a, fig a table, and no one likes to study a table because there's no pretty pictures, but I like to start down here at the type of muscle first. All right, so if we think about our postural muscles, such as those in your neck, all right, Think about what those neck muscles have to do all day, right? They need to generate enough energy to last a very long time, a.k.a. all day, right? Because you've got to keep your head up all day long. So those muscles need fibers that can generate energy for a long period of time. Now remember what that means. That means we're going to need aerobic respiration. All right, so these muscle fibers are known as slow oxidative fibers. Oxidative refers to cellular respiration. All right, we don't need to get into the biology here, but when you see oxidative, that's how that aerobic respiration produces ATP. So what else are you going to need? Well, you're going to need a lot of oxygen. So these cells have a large amount of myoglobin. You're going to need a lot of mitochondria because that's where this happens. So you're going to have more mitochondria. You're going to have more blood flow because you need more oxygen from the blood. The cells are actually more red because of this high levels of myoglobin and blood flow. And then you can generate energy for long periods of time, but you're not going to be very fast. right? Remember, fast is creatine phosphate, and glycolysis. So you're going to be slow oxidative fibers. All right? Now, you're going to have a high resistance to fatigue. 
So what that means is you can last all day long, right? You can keep your head up all day long, but can you contract your fingers all day long? Can you move your arms all day long and not stop them? No, you're going to fatigue, all right? You're going to have low creatine. You're going to have uh, lower glycogen, all right? So these are all properties of slow oxidative fibers that are in a high abundance in muscles that need to be kind of contracting all day long, maintaining posture, or if you're going to be doing endurance activities for long periods of time, all right? Now, I want to jump over to the last column here because this is at the extreme other end, all right? If you are fast glycolytic, right, look at that word, glycolytic, you're going to be doing more anaerobic glycolysis, and that can generate energy faster. So you're fast glycolytic. So what muscles would require a lot of these fibers? Muscles of your upper limbs, right? Because your upper limbs, you know, you often have to move your arms pretty quickly. Right, so you're going to generate a lot of energy quickly, but they're going to fatigue very quickly. Right, think about moving your arms all day long. You're not going to be able to do it. Right, but think about doing jumping jacks and moving those arms constantly. Um, you're going to be able to do it in short bursts, but because you're relying on glycolysis, you can't do produce energy for long term. So. They're going to have less myoglobin. They're going to have less mitochondria. There's less blood flow. They're more of white. All right, so the muscle's actually a little more white. Um, they're going to be generating energy by glycolysis, which is faster, but fatigues very quickly. So these cells have a low fatigue resistance. All right, and they're going to have a high amount of creatine, for that more of a quick burst of energy. All right, so now we just look at the middle one and that's kind of the middle of the road. So it's kind of an intermediate muscle fiber. They're called fast oxidative glycolytic. So again, kind of middle of the road. They're gonna have myoglobin, but maybe not as much as, as these guys. Um, they're gonna be maybe not as red as these guys because they might not have as much myoglobin and blood flow. Um, they're going to kind of be intermediate. They do both aerobic and anaerobic glycolysis. All right. What kind of muscles? Think about your legs compared to your arms. So you probably can't do jumping jacks all day long with your arms, but could you walk, you know, for hours? Yeah. All right. If you're going on a hike or just walking around town, you can contract your muscles of your legs for a much longer time than your arms, all right? So lower limb muscles, walking and sprinting even, are gonna have a higher amount of these fibers than the other two, all right? So understanding this, you gotta understand the ATP stuff first, all right? But once you understand those three forms of ATP and and you know how much energy is it short term is it long term then this kind of makes much more sense okay so you'll be asked about these kinds of muscles and what kind of fibers are they do they have these kinds these kinds and you might ask be asked a little bit more about these properties but again if you understand what aerobic respiration is this should make sense. And if you understand what glycolysis is, this should make sense. And then these guys are kind of intermediate. All right, so that is chapter nine. It's a big one. It's a lot of function. Um, we're going to work through this, you know, topic by topic. Try, try to not do too much in one sitting, but work on these topics. And again, animations are your friend. Uh, let me know if there's any questions or anything I can do to help.